and thank you very much for having me um, here for a Cranbrook History Center at Talk. Um, let me share my slides. Okay, so um, I hope you hear me okay. Um, my name is Ayaka Yoshimizu, and I'm speaking as an uninvited guest on the stolen land of Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, which is also home to many urban indigenous peoples from elsewhere. And it's a great honor to be able to share my research with you. I am very much humbled to speak to the audience, majority of whom I think live in Kootenays, perhaps for generations. And I'm a complete outsider and I only started to learn about the history of this region. So I'm here rather to learn from all of you and I look forward to your comments after the talk. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that part of my research took place on the land of Tunaha, uh, Suiluk and uh, Sinacht First Nations. And I really enjoyed Sophie Piel's talk in May. It was very educational for me. And I'm interested in learning more about Tanaha culture, spirituality, and relationship to the land. I'd like to thank David Humphrey at Crample History Center and John Philip Steen at Touchstone Nelson Museum for their support with finding relevant archival materials. And finally, I also like to acknowledge that my research is built on my joint work with my former research partner, Julia Aoki. Um, this research is still ongoing and um, was disrupted by pandemic and I'll come back to the Kootenays in the near future. So I hope to uh, meet some of you then. Um, as you can see in this picture here, I conduct field work at cemeteries and other memorial sites. And my research is concerned with individuals who are not treated as fully humans when they're alive and therefore become less visible in public commemorative space and easily forgotten in their afterlife. And I was, as, as I was preparing for this talk, the remains of 215 indigenous children were discovered in the ground of the former Kamloop, uh, Kamloops Indian Residential School and their death and burials were undocumented. And um, today I was informed by my partner just now about another story about unmarked graves at former residential school in Saskatchewan. So as a new settler and occupant in the unceded First Nations land, I'd like to take this as an issue of my own and decognize that we are situated on the land in which a lot of colonial violence has taken place and that these issues are still ongoing. And I'm also responsible for developing an ethical relationship to the land and to the First Nation communities. So this is the title of my presentation today. And I'll be talking about Japanese trans migrants who lived in Kootenai regions um, at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, but I intentionally chose the term memories over the history um, in my title, because my research is concerned more with the questions of how we remember the lives and death of those migrants and how their stories are memorialized today, how their lives have been forgotten. And if their stories are underrepresented, misrepresented or hardly documented, which is very much the case, what are some possible and ethical ways to remember their lives? Um, one important concept that I draw on in my research is grievability. And this idea is introduced by a scholar called Judith Butler, and I won't go in detail, but in this book, Precarious Life, she asks um, who counts as human, whose lives count as lives, what makes for grievable life. And many studies, um, academic studies, have shown that the lives of minoritized groups, such as indigenous peoples, racialized groups, women, people of lower class, uh, low status, and disabled people are made invisible in public commemorative space, such as you know, obituaries and cemeteries. And I encounter the same problem as I conduct research about Japanese migrant sex workers. So doing field work um, um, at cemeteries and memorial sites, both in Canada and in Japan, I encountered headstones belonging to migrant sex workers that seem unattended, anonymous collective graves that fail to commemorate individual women and absence of markers that make invisible their burial locations. So their lives are made ungrievable. So in my research, I examine the ungrievability of migrant sex workers and make their ungrievability visible and explore ethical ways to remember their lives. I wanna continue going back to the title of my talk and break it down one by one. Uh, I just talked about the memories part. So now, now I wanna talk about a little bit about Japanese people in Kootenays. 
when you think of Japanese people in Kootenays, I think one important history that we need to remember is the internment of Japanese Canadians during Second World War. And I'm sorry, this, this map is a little bit hard to, to see, but this is the map that shows the locations of Japanese Canadian internment camps in BC. And a lot of them, as you can see, I, I, don't, I don't know if you see my cursor here, uh, and this is the enlarged map of Slocum Lake. And you can see a lot of um, camps were located along around the Slocum Lake. But the history I'm interested in predates this history. So before the internment, most of Japanese Canadian people lived on the coast. So we tend to immediately think of the former Japantown on the Powell Street. We also know that there was a vibrant fishery community in Steveston, but there were Japanese migrants who also lived in the interior of BC and even east of Rockies at the turn of the 20th century. And many of them, uh, both men and women, happened to be involved in the sex trade. Um, so this comes from a Japanese language source that I will properly introduce later. But, and I'm sorry that the place names are written in Japanese, but this map shows the locations of Japanese brothels in early 20th century. Um, and as you can see, Japanese brothels existed all along, um, all across BC and they even extend, extending beyond the Rockies. And they developed along the newly built uh, Canadian Pacific Railway, as well as in mining towns. And this happened in the last decade of the 19th century and or they are quite bivalent throughout the first decade of the first 20th century. So I'm gonna just read out some of the place names that are listed in this source. Um, Ashcroft, Kunloops, Burnham, Kelowna, Rebel Stoke, Three Valley, Golden, Greenwood, uh, Grand Forks, Rossland, Trail, Nelson, Castle, Wartner, Crumbook, Fernie, Hosmer, Blaymore, and the list just goes on. Um, and it's kind of, um, it amounts to over 30 places. So these are all the places where Japanese brothel uh, was found. And one thing to note is that Japanese sex workers, pimps and procurers and brothel owners were often transient migrants who did not necessarily settle in any one specific town, province, or even country, but they continued moving on across multiple borders, escaping from their employers or local regulations when they become stricter, uh, seeking new opportunities or new lives or last resort for survival. Uh, many eventually returned to Japan as regulations of prostitution became stricter in the interior towns in BC in the early 1910s. Regardless of the different circumstances under which women entered the sex trade, in most cases they came from impoverished villages um, in Japan. And once in the trafficking system, they became private positions of their owners, bound by imposed debt until they successfully repaid it. Um, and their freedom was highly restricted. And in addition, women involved in sex trade were generally perceived as fallen women or a necessary evil at best. Um, so they were stigmatized and ostracized by the Japanese migrant community in Canada, but also even by their own families back home in Japan. And stories of Japanese migrant sex workers in North America are hardly documented or passed down to younger generations because many of them eventually left, died young, or did not have legitimate children, and of course, because of stigma. Another key word here is Trans-Pacific. And I add this term before Kootenays to highlight how this region and more broadly BC have historically been shaped by their relationship to Asia particularly by migration of Asian people across the Pacific. And this has been discussed uh, by many Asian Canadian scholars. So if you're interested, um, I, I'm happy to provide more resources to talk about this later. Um, I've mentioned that in Canada, uh, Japanese brothels developed along CPR um, and as well as in the mining towns. And the same goes to Chinese brothels. So Chinese prostitution started even earlier, I believe, and it thrived in mining towns along the CPR and coastal cities. And you probably know how Chinese migrant men were mobilized as cheap and disposable labor in the construction of um, CPR. And Asian women were also mobilized as cheap and disposable reproductive labor to serve working class men with diverse racial backgrounds. 
So they all contributed to the settler colonial project of building Canada as a nation state. And I, in my research, I specifically looked at the underground network that was spread across the Pacific Ocean, which facilitated migration of Japanese people for involved in the sex trade. So I used the term trans-Pacific underground to talk about the social space in which these migrants lived and moved. Uh, this source, again, is Japanese language source, um, but um, this is a really interesting story. Um, so it comes from Japanese language newspaper called Taidiku Nippo or Continental News. And I heavily rely on this, this source in my research. And here I found a story about this woman called Chie Ota. And she initially uh, migrated to Singapore and engaged in sex work and then moved to Hong Kong and married a British man. And through this marriage, she obtained a British passport. And the couple and their fam, uh, five children moved to Nagasaki, where Chie Ota is, Nagasaki is uh, where Chie Ota is from. It's a um, uh, port city in, in sorry, it's, um, it's a yeah, uh, prefecture in Japan. And, um, but Chie Ota soon left her family behind and attempted to travel to Spokane in the US alone with the intention of finding work at the brothel. And uh, she first arrived at the port of Victoria and she, from there she tried to enter the US but she was denied entry. And so instead she moved to Nelson and then Calgary searching for work. So this is just an interesting example um, that tells you how expansive that underground network was. And so North America is not the only place outside Japan where Japanese women engage in the sex trade. Um, and in fact, Japanese women enter the sex trade in all over the world, including um, East Asian countries and Southeast Asian countries, but also Russia, Australia, South America, and even India and Africa. Uh, many women were legally and illegally recruited for sexual services aimed at young men working in colonial ports and plantations and the construction of railways. And this table uh, shows the number of Japanese women in prostitution related businesses overseas. And the numbers come from Japanese government record. And this uh, is specifically from 1907. Um, in, at this time in 1907, there was no, uh, there was an occupational category for prostitutes in the government recording system, but a considerable number of Japanese women who had uh, reported their occupation as waitress or barmaids had engaged in prostitution in various capacities. So in my larger work, um, I look at memorials of Japanese women involved in transnational sex trade in other parts of the world as well. And when I talk about memorials, of course, I talk about memorial installations and graves, headstones and other memorial tower monuments, but also look at um, literature and theatrical plays um, and other cultural texts and objects as well. So in the rest of the talk, I want to talk specifically about memories of Japanese migrant sex workers in Trans-Pacific Kootenays. So in my research in BC, I combine archival research and field work at various memorial sites. And one big problem I, 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 sorry, the problem I encounter as I conduct archival research is that any stories and documents about Japanese sex workers that I discover in the archives do not represent their own voices, but they are written by men in power who are often critical, usually critical of sex workers. And this is pointed out by Kazuhiro Harazeki, a um, Japanese historian who studied the history of Japanese prostitutes in North American West. And he notes exactly the same issue in the sources he uses in his research. So one of the primary sources I rely on is a newspaper column series published by Taidi Kunipo newspaper. This is part of the UBC's special collection. And this series is entitled Exploration of Devil Caves. And devil caves refer to brothels. So from now on, whenever I say caves, that means brothels. And the first part was published between 1908 and 1909. And the second part uh, was published in 1912. And this was written by a journalist called Shohei Osada. 
And the series presents an elaborated account of the lives of Japanese men and women involved in the sex trade in Canada. And Osada's intention um, in publishing this series was to expose um, their identities and shame their behavior and ultimately eradicate prostitution among the Japanese in Canada because uh, they thought their presence contributes to anti-Japanese anti sentiment among white settlers. And stories were written in a tabloid style with hyperbolic language, highlighting individuals' names and some sen um, sensational phrases in a big and bold font. Its style is quite theatrical and provides dramatic descriptions of violence, internal conflicts, and relationship scandals. Um, the series apparently proved, proved very popular with readers. So the first part was re-edited and reorganized into a book with a new title, Brothels in Canada, and it was published in uh, 1910 in Vancouver. So this is a photocopy of the book. Again, um, uh, you can access it at UBC's special collection. Um, I approach archival materials very critically, paying attention to the biases of the, their authors and the context in which those sources are produced. So I read the archives against the grain. So going back to Osada's series, um, to write the Devil Cave series, Osada left Vancouver for interior towns on September 2nd, 1908 to collect stories. And he stayed in these towns until he returned to the Taidik Nippo's office in Vancouver on November 14th, 1908. So he spent over two months in interior towns and he spent most of his time in Cranbrook and Nelson the places that he identifies as the two major towns for Japanese prostitution. So I'm gonna just read out this quote. Currently, the interior caves that most deserve our attention include Nelson and Cranbrook. Each has four caves and they're located inside the town. Nelson has, has them stand side by side with white caves on, and on the back street of Chinatown. Cranbrook has them also mixed with white caves in front of the CPR station. In total of 14 women work in Nelson and 10 in Cranbrook. He also goes on to say uh, that he's surprised by the fact that both in Nelson and Cranbrook, these brothels explicitly display signs without fear, such as Japanese house or Tokyo house, uh, while women themselves actually went by English nicknames, such as Josie and Maple. So of course, I didn't agree with Osada's intention behind publishing their, this, this series. And, I find his writing problematic. At the same time, this is, this is one of few sources that tell us anything about these women's lives in details. Um, so what I did to begin my research was to follow Osada's footsteps and visited these two cities with the hope of finding something more about the history of Japanese sex workers. In Nelson, I visited Touchstone's museum and archivist um, J.P. Steen was, uh, he kindly collected relevant archival materials for me, and I'm sharing just a few here. Um, there's a book uh, by Kenneth Morrow, and the title is Ladies of Easy Virtue in the West Kootenai. Um, and according to this book, the red light district in Nelson was originally located near the extreme east end of Baker Street. And the demand for sex workers was produced in response to the mining boom around the area. And during the early years, police raids were uncommon. And, uh, but the, as the town grew, residents started to complain about the presence of red light district and a petition was submitted to the city in 1899. And this resulted in the relocation of the district to Lake Street between Hull and Ward Streets. And Lake Street uh, was where Chinese laundries and groceries were located and the neighborhood was referred to as Chinatown. So this map um, actually comes from um, 1898, so uh, a year before the relocation happened, but this is the Lake Street. And at this corner, if you look at this closely, maybe you cannot see it, uh, it says Chinese, uh, laundry or grocery. And uh, Morrow's book also notes a period of, period of um, vigorous arrest and prosecution of sex workers and madams, which, which happened in October, 1908. And this is a time when Osada was doing his research in Nelson and Cranbrook. 
This comes from memoirs of um, Bill Hall, again, part of Touchstone's Nelson Museum collection. And in this section of Nelson's brothels, he writes, uh, brothels on 700 block Baker Street, city council, how they moved down to Lake Street. It's recorded that Japanese girls were first occupants. And this comes from Nelson police record of 1909, the late landladies of Lake Street. And you can see two names. I'm having a hard time pronouncing this, Sosie um, and Jenny. And uh, right beside them, it says Japanese. So these are very kind of fragmented um, documents that I was able to find in the local museum. Um, regional governments like city officials uh, tolerated prostitution in early days. So they would regularly arrest sex workers and collect fines or bribes, but they wouldn't actively try to ab abolish prostitution. And in fact, the sum of money collected from sex workers became an important source of income for the cities. So according to Morrow's book, the city made more than $4,000 uh, $4, per year in early 1900s. So the city um, did benefit from the sex trade. And Osada's newspaper series, um, there's an interesting description about the police attitude towards Japanese uh, sex workers and brothels. And he says Nelson came, so Japanese brothels in Nelson received the best police care. Um, and he says, all police have to look after caves, but in Nelson, police take care of them willingly. To take care may not be an appropriate way to describing it, but it is a firm fact that the police at least indirectly offer them protection. Um, and it was not apparently not that the police were generous with everybody in the sex trade, but they are particularly generous with Japanese brothels. And this is Osada's observation. And he speculates the reason why. And he concludes that it's because some brothel owners have uh, spread money around in early days. And because of this, they, they are well received by the authority. Um, but he also notes that in Nelson, there was no other Japanese people um, in town. So every Japanese person in Nelson were involved in the sex trade or prostitution business in some way, and which resulted in the lack of conflicts within the Japanese community again, kind of contributed to uh, the positive reception of uh, Japanese brothel, brothels. The episode uh, I quote here from December 16, 1908, highlights how the police in Nelson favored Japanese people running brothels over other Japanese uh, visitors. So he goes, one time Japanese laborers visited Nelson for some business and stayed at a hotel in the city. Of course, they went out at night too. Then they caught an officer's attention and got an earful. The officer goes, for what purpose did you come to this town? There's no place for you to work. You will cause some trouble at the brothel. Leave the town now. Protecting brothels and causing trouble for straight people or honest laborers, I cannot even come up with a word to critique this. Whenever Osada uses the term straight people or straight businesses, that means people who are not um, involved in prostitution businesses or criminal, criminalized activities. In terms of Cranbrook, uh, Osada writes, police in Cranbrook also have a relatively tolerant attitude. But he also notes that the presence of Japanese people running straight businesses um, caused some tension and conflicts within the Japanese community. So I'm gonna just read another quote. Um, Crumbook sometimes has conflicts between caves and straight fellows. It seems that the conflicts have faded lately, but the situation was terrible around a year or two years ago. Uh, there used to be unreasonable requests. Give me drinks, give me money, which escalated into dramas where tables flip, bottles fly, and sometimes even Western knives sparkle. Whenever there is a conflict between the straight and the cave, Police always support brothels and severely punish violent clients. So at the Crown Book archives, uh, David Humphrey found two entries pertaining to a Japanese person. Uh, this is from St. Eugene Hospital, Doctors King and Green Day Book. And it says, it's, these are from November 6, 1908 and November 8, 1908. 
and you can see S Suji, jab, stab, hand. Um, so something, some violent um, incident must have happened. Um, in the article I just quoted uh, from the um, Osada's series was written a month later. So it's entirely possible that Osada was in Kronbok when this incident happened. Um, and he, you know, while he was doing feet work in Kronbok and Nelson. Uh, but this is only speculation, but I, I thought the dates kind of coincide and I thought this is interesting. And this is a section of a map from Cranbrook History Center's uh, Cranbrook Heritage Map. And according to Jim Cameron's book, Cranbrook Then and Now, the red light district in Cranbrook first developed on the east side of Clark Avenue between Louise and Edwards Street. So I just highlighted this section in um, orange. So this is where the original red light district um, was located. So again, in, right in front of the CPL station as Osada. Uh, describes. Perhaps the richest documentation of the lives of Japanese women in brothels can be found in Osada's book, Brothels in Canada, under the section Everyday Life of Prostitutes. And this illustrates a day in a brothel in Nelson. And it's rather a long quote, but I'd like to share it, share it with you. And again, Osada's language is biased and disdainful, but I tried to read it against the grain. And I want to invite you to read it against the grain. Um, and then his writing starts to tell us about the, the vibrancy and the richness of the community of those who survived the underground. She would wake up at around noon, rubbing her sleepy eyes almost closed. Her oversized flat face is white spotted with face powder from the previous night, making her look like a child deer. What's with you, Miss Maple? Wake up, it's already noon. She would run across her neighbor guest rooms to the cleaning helpers, though not necessarily force them to get up. She'd rather roll an extra amount of Durham cigar powder and have a smoke before going to wash her face with a towel in her hand. As she gazes vacantly at the course of smoke, another woman would approach her on tiptoe from behind, yelling, boo. Stop romping around, go wash your face now, yells a pimp, who has been working hard to prepare a meal in the kitchen for a while. Pimps are responsible for all the work in the kitchen. They would stamp into the kitchen just like ducklings chased down by a bully along the stream outside the back door. They would then wash their faces, do all the regular cleaning, and sit at the tables still with their pajamas on. They'd have half an hour idle chatter, leave behind laughter that is so loud that it's pierced through the seating, and move back to their guest rooms. One would start her shamisen practice. Shamisen is a Japanese um, traditional instrument, just like the raindrops. And then continue reading Mamushino um, Omasa. So Omasa the Viper, this is the title of a novel. Another look for mystery novel she had started. There's a greedy one who would send a pimp off to town to get candies or fruits and fill her mouth full. There are yet others who would um, put thick makeup on their shameless faces behind the doors and go out to town for shopping. So again, I hope this kind of gives you um, some image, some picture of how a everyday life of prostitutes have, might have looked like. Of course, it's dramatized. And as I, I as it turned out, both in Nelson and Cranbrook, I found myself spending most of, most of my time in cemeteries, looking for graves that might belong to Japanese sex workers, putting flowers on them and praying for their spirits. What I noticed at the cemeteries is that um, those, those Japanese graves from early 20th century seemed unattended or uncared for. And I decided to call these graves unmemorials rather than memorials. And I define un unmemorials as um, sites, objects, and installations that potentially allow commemoration of lost lives or past events. But the possibility of commemoration is undone undermined or diminished because they lack a community of commemorators or narratives that enable commemoration. So what I do at the cemetery is pay attention to the materiality of the unmemorials that I encounter there and try to listen to whatever story that these unmemorials might tell us. I'm not able to produ produce a rich and coherent story about these women, but at least I can make their ungrievability sensible. 
and I try to generate new meanings of these um, memorials. So I'm going to share my encounter with those who are buried in Cranbrook and Nelson's old cemeteries. And I share some images, but I only show a portion of the headstones, partly out of privacy concern, but I also feel that this might effectively convey the elusiveness of this history. In Cranbrook Old Cemetery, Japanese graves were clustered together with Chinese graves in a section furthest from the entrance. And this grave that I find um, in Cranbrook Old Cemetery is very interesting. In Japanese modern burial tradition, you would normally expect to find only one family name in the headstone. Now, this headstone is interesting because in addition to the name of the person who is buried here, um, Sadayon Rata, which is a pseudonym that I came up, uh, it also includes another name, Tifkuda, and they don't share the same family name. So what can this mean? Is this person a man or woman? Is T buried together with Sadayo or T the one who erected this grave for her? What is T's relationship to Sadayo? Um, is this person her lover, employer, coworker, or friend? Um, for all the graves I found, I also searched the death registrations of the people they belong to. And the profession, her profession says housekeeper. And of course it can be interpreted in different ways. And in Cranbrook, apparently, there were both straight and cave businesses, according to Osada's writing. So she may or may not have been a sex worker. And the next uh, headstone, the Japanese inscription of this grave uh, reads, the grave of Toku Iketani. Again, this is a pseudonym. Below the English inscription reads, native of Wakayama Ken, Japan, aged 32 years, died December 16, 1909. And this person actually appears in Osada's newspaper series very briefly when he writes that she passed away and her husband has returned to Japan after her death. And according to Osada, Toku Iketani was a sex worker. And when I look up her death registration, her occupation says housekeeper, the same as Sadayo Murata, the previous person. So it's, it's possible again that Sadayo was also a sex worker. Uh, the death registration, by the way, completely misspells her name. And it's very far from Japanese sounding name. And this happens a lot when, when you search through Japanese uh, death records in Canada, a lot of names are spelled wrong. This headstone belongs to Misao Kimura. And on her death record, her profession is again housekeeper. I am struck, struck by her name um, in Japanese, Misao. Her first name means chastity. So um, if she was actually a sex worker, it's very ironic um, for a woman whose name meant chastity to get involved in the sex trade. And Osada's De Devil Cave series briefly mentions a woman whose nickname was Misao. So he says, how foolish is it to name a prostitute Misao, um, implying that this is her pimp who gave her this nickname. And I don't know if Misao, that. Osada writes about is the same Misao that I found in the cemetery. But I also wanna note that Misao has second meaning, which is, uh, which is dignity. And that changes the way you um, perhaps interpret um, the, the, this um, memorial. So I'm moving to Nelson um, now. And according to Osada, uh, no Japanese person except for cave fellows lived in Nelson at this time. If this is true, there's a very high chance that the woman who died in Nelson back then were involved in the sex trade. And in Nelson, Japanese graves from the early 20th century were found either in general section number one or number two. And these graves were not pushed toward the edge or segregated from the rest of the graves like in Cranbrook, but they are clustered together in the same blocks. So Japanese um, graves are clustered together. And this grave was found in general section number two but unlisted in the burial index. So if you don't walk around to look for um, this grave, you do, wouldn't be able to find it. The inscri inscription of this grave reads, Japanese, Chika Noguchi, born in Shizuoka, in Japan, died October 30th, 1904, aged 24 years. And this headstone stands side by side with another smaller grave. And according to the English inscription of this smaller grave, uh, she died on May 18th, 1906, and uh, she was aged one day. 
and hits known doesn't indicate her first name, suggesting that she probably didn't get to be named before she died. Um, and the Japanese inscription reads Japanese um, girl rabbit. So assuming that Chika's headstone had already been here when the baby was buried, I wonder what brought the baby's remains to be buried right next to Chika's. It might have been institutional racism to, you know, to assemble a lump together, Japs, quote unquote, in the same location, or it might have been a mother's wish so the baby stays close to a member of her own people or something else. Whatever the circumstance was, the pair of Japanese headstones does look like that of a parent and child. When I look at the pair of graves, chicas and the baby girls, what, what came to my mind was the fact that many sex workers didn't produce legitimate children who would look after their graves or pass on stories about them to the next generations. But it was in a sense nice to see the pair of graves. So perhaps Chika is growing parent-child-like relationship in her afterlife with a baby buried next to her. Uh, this one, the inscription, inscription reads, in memory of Waka Furuta, died April 11, 1907, aged 28 years, erected by her friends. Um, in his De Devil Cave series, Osada highlights internal conflicts between brothel managers over popular sex workers or over money. Um, he also highlights relationship conflicts over adultery, and one exception might be when he mentions how women in Nelson have union-like cooperative working relations. And a grave like this indeed uh, proves the presence of relationships and solidarity that women constructed and were a part of. And lastly, I found the name Aki Masanaga in the burial index of the Nelson Memorial Park. And according to this record, she died on the October 26, 1914, very on the same day in general section number one. The block number is unknown and the same record indicates N for the presence of a marker, which means that there's no headstone erected for her. So how do I tend to her remains if they cannot be traced to the specific location within the cemetery? Where exactly should I place flowers when there's no headstones? The absence of the marker of Aki makes me wonder about other bodies that may lie underneath without having markers that establish their locations. I also recall a number of unnamed burials that I saw in the index. So how do we remember those unnamed spirits? And instead of trying to pin down their locations, I prefer to attend to the space in between graves, um, um, ambiguous space from which I imagine Aki and other women were ma made ungrievable in a public commemorative space. And the photographs, uh, many of them were by my partner, uh, Tadahumi Tamura, who is a photographer. I just forgot to include, I mean, there's a credit here, but it's white, written in white and it's erased. So yeah, this is, this is it. I have a few slides to just introduce some of the historical studies um, pertaining to this history. This is uh, some studies about Japanese sex workers in Canada and the United States. And this is a few examples, um, studies of Chinese uh, sex workers in BC and also again, um, North America in general. Thank you very much. I'm gonna stop sharing now. Thank you so much, uh, Ayaka, for such an informative and interesting talk about something that I think very few, if any of us, have ever uh, read about or learned about before. Uh, I want to open up uh, to the audience to ask questions, and I've noticed already that Eileen has written a question uh, in the chat, so I'll read that aloud for everyone. Eileen has asked, have you encountered any fetishization of exotic women streaming from the trans-Pacific sex trade? What happened to the children of sex workers? Could they attend school? Yeah, I'm gonna answer the uh, the last two questions first. So I've encountered some descriptions about children actually, and because their mother is working uh, in brothels and usually this is a nighttime work, um, so they're not able to raise their children. So what happens often is that they're um, adopted by foster family. Sometimes uh, they, that can be non-Japanese white families as well. And I um, specifically encounter one description about this, um, this woman who can visit her children on, uh, on the weekend. 
Um, and I, I assume in this case, uh, the children would be able to go to school. Um, Yes, yeah, I actually uh, know of a few examples like this where um, children were not actually directly raised by the sex workers. Um, exotic women. Yes, it's everywhere, <laughs> everywhere, right? Um, and um, even apart from my current research, I did my research in, in Japan um, about uh, non-Japanese transnational sex workers in contemporary Japan and the same you know, goes to how these women, um, many are from Southeast Asian countries and how they are exoticized and how they are um, imagined as accessible, um, hypersexual, um, and have this idea of, you know, these women coming from a culture where sex is more, more openly accepted. And again, this is, this is a very, stereo, you know, it's a stereotype um, and a very problematic idea but these images representations um, exist everywhere. Um, in, you know, how, how people talk about it or in films, popular culture, uh, even newspaper representations. So yeah, yes, I do, I do encounter this. Thank you, Aideen. Aideen. Thank you for your question, Eileen. Uh, I wanna open it up to Anybody else, if you want to ask a question out loud, you can always unmute yourself. Uh, Fernanda, uh, you can go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering if there are um, medical records that um, that refer, like medical or police records uh, regarding these women that uh, say, I don't know what kind of system, uh, sanitary system, uh, Canada implemented back then because I'm from Mexico and uh, I also am involved in a research uh, with sex workers in the 19th century. So it was like a the French uh, the French model that was implemented in Mexico and uh, they there had there had like all sex workers had had to have a uh, like a, an ID and there was a sanitary police and they made the raids and yeah i mean it's so similar to to what i was uh, hearing from you I, were you able to find these medical or police records uh, regarding women and how they were classified and uh which brothels they attended or is there any information regarding that yeah uh that's a great question i i my, i i would think that it's maybe varied depending on the you know depending on the town because uh, the regulation was actually implemented by the, the municipal government. It, it was not, not a province-wide regulation. But um, so I have to, I would have to look into that actually. I still haven't really uh, came across with, I haven't done a, a lot of uh, research into English sources. Um, so I would, for, yeah, so I would have to go back again to, to Cranbrook and Nelson to do that. But um, I think in Japanese language source, he does talk about how it was, yeah, um, more about the police attitude toward um, sex workers and the kind of interpersonal relationship that they developed rather than kind of overall uh, policies. So yeah, that's a really good question. Something I need to look into. Thank you. Thank you. That's so amazing, Fernanda, to hear the connections between the research that you're doing and that Ayaka is doing. Um, Sue has unmuted herself. Go ahead, Sue. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Yoshimizu. This is really fascinating. Um, I have been working on a fictionalized project that is um, centered around sex workers um, in 1917. And I was wondering, I have a couple questions. One. Uh, would there have been Japanese sex workers here in 1917? I know that um, regulations uh, kept increasing and, and uh, uh, sex work was more policed um, by that era. But, um, and the other thing uh, I was specifically wondering is, um, do you know what kind of relationships they might have had with sex workers of other ethnicities? Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, by 1917, I think that the population of sex work, Japanese sex workers in Canada, I think, ha, um, had diminished by then. A lot of them, again, returned to Japan. Um, and many women who are in interior towns working as sex workers, um, some of them who stayed in Canada 
um, came to uh, moved to Vancouver and they started to work in you know in a different occupations. But there's um, um, one Japanese madam, um, Kyo um, Goto Tanaka Goto, uh, who is quite well known among the Japanese community in, in Vancouver, Lower Mainland. And she was running uh, the brothel on the Hastings Street. And I think that uh, brothel was running in 1917. And there's um, uh, the performance hosted by, organized by Power Street Festival Society. And it only happened one time in, in, in that year. I, I can look it up which year that took place, but that was around this madam, Kiyo Tanaka Goto. And there, there's a, some writing about this woman that I can, I'm happy to share with you later. And uh, what was the second second question? Sorry. Uh, thanks. Um, the other question was if you knew uh, what kind of relationships they might have with sex workers of other ethnicities. Right. So um, interestingly, a lot of women who worked in the interior towns uh, didn't actively um, took Japanese clients, and they rather preferred non-Japanese. Clients. So, of course, there was um, pseudo kind of um, lover relationship uh, that women developed with, uh, for example, Chinese clients. Um, and, you know, uh, they would try to escape from the bull cell to, to stay with this person. Um, so definitely uh, the, the worker client relationship was um, pan-ethnic or cross-ethnic. Um, there was some instances where other sex workers, non-Japanese sex workers are mentioned in Osada's writing too. So, um, although it's not really detailed, but I would say because the brothels are standing side by side, I think they would have an everyday encounter and they might have developed some sort of cooperative relationship among themselves. Thanks Thank so you, that's a really great question. Thank you, Sue. That's a really interesting project to be embarking on. Uh, is there anybody else who has a question they'd like to ask Ayaka? Uh, you can type it in the chat or unmute yourself. I do have one as well, uh, if nobody steps forward. Um, so uh, Ayaka, I, uh, it actually ties in a little bit with Eileen's question earlier. I was when I was first speaking to you about coming to speak uh, at the Cranbrook History Center for this talk, um, it was around the time uh, when that, uh, the attack on the Asian workers at the uh, at the massage parlor in Atlanta, Georgia took place. And it kind of had me reflecting on, even in the present day, the way that Asian women are over-sexualized in Western culture. And I wondered if you could speak about why you think that learning about the history of this and that story of sexualization um, can kind of help us understand the context that we're living in today. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really important question. I think it's important to seriously examine um, our imaginations, how we imagine and perceive Asian women, uh, non-white women in our everyday life, because we do act on our imaginations, right? So again, uh, going back to my earlier research in Japan, because this is more contemporary, um, you know, the demand for non-Japanese, um, especially Asian sex workers, were partly um, fed by this imagination of these women to be accessible and hypersexual. Um, and interestingly, in Japan, uh, starting in 1970s, Japanese sex workers started to be replaced uh, with uh, non-Japanese Asian sex workers. Um, so a lot of transnational sex workers started to uh, be became visible starting in the late 1970s, but more prominently in 1990s, 80s and 1990s. And, and then it's, we are entering into another sort of stage where um, based on the same sort of imagination, Japanese government um, started to recruit uh, women from the same countries in Southeast Asia, um, care workers, because Jap Japanese society is, is aging. So there are, you know, a lot of things can be said about this, but um, we, we have to first acknowledge that uh, the history is built on a lot of unrecognized labor, um, including sex workers, but also care workers. Today too, the front, uh, frontline workers during the pandemic, a lot of them are Asian women um, and men, of course, but, um, and we have to stop and question why this is, this is happening. 
Um, and, you know, we also have to be critical of how we uh, perceive um, women. Um, are they in this occupation because they're um, naturally, you know, suited to this kind of work? Or is this, you know, the reason is some, you know, it's lying some, somewhere else. Maybe this is our, how we imagine, how we um, exploit uh, women based on their perceived accessibility and their class status, so on and so forth. So I think that question again is very important and we have to think critically about um, the presentations and imaginations of Asian women. Thank you. I, that's definitely giving me some many things to think about as as we see the way that especially the media has been responding and and the way that the media portrays, especially with this attack in Atlanta, uh, the Asian woman who who were murdered. Um, we have some questions in the chat that I wanted to uh, uh, point out. Uh, Michelle asked uh, about the you mentioning workers who returned to Japan, and she was wondering if there are any stories of their lived experience that had been passed down through generations and how that could add to the narrative. Right. So, yeah, there are more writings uh, and cultural works like films and theater about Japanese women who went to Southeast Asia. And some of them, again, did return to Japan. And there are Japanese um, in 90s, 70s and 80s, some Jap feminist uh, historians did research about this. So there's um, some oral account um, documented uh, in that during that time. Um, Usually um, a lot of women who come back to Japan are disowned by their family again because of stigma. And it's, it's, it's um, very, you know, it's, it's hard. Um, it's terrible because these family actually benefited from the money sent, you know, uh, by these women while they're working abroad. And when they come back, um, they had to, to cut ties from their family. Um, so again, it's very difficult for them to pass on their stories to their immediately family members because of stigma. Um, and it's actually um, stranger uh, historians who are able to collect these stories. Um, and again, I might, I'd be happy to share some of the um, writings with you. Um, although most of them are written in Japanese, some have been translated into English. Thank you. I. Uh, if, oh, are you paused? Are you there, Ayaka? It looks like your video is paused. Uh, I, I'll get, I'll ask you to share an email that people can reach out to you uh, in the chat so that for those who wanted to kind of ask follow-up questions, they'll be able to reach you. Uh, I noticed, Bill and Tessa, that you've muted your, unmuted yourselves. Do you have a question to ask? Uh, I, may, I may have missed it in the presentation, but I was just wondering, do, do you know um, the, the extent of, that that these women came on their own volition uh did they come specifically to to work in this trade or did they come for some other reason and then get co-opted into them that's a great question there are different uh cases so some women were um in some cases women already working as sex workers in japan and they came to canada in search for better opportunities. But in some other cases, um, women were, you know, forcefully brought by deception and they're putting it into the trade. Or in some other cases, they came as a picture brides. Um, so some, a lot of women um, at the, uh, in early 20th century, they came to Canada as brides, as um, wives of Japanese men who are already settled in Canada. And they're called picture brides because they, uh, only exchange pictures across the ocean and they make this arrangement, um, get married on paper and they receive passport and they came to Canada. But anyway, sometimes the, the marriage didn't go well and they exit their marriage and enter the sex trade because for, for some women that was the, the more liberating than staying in, the, in, in their marriage. So there are just a range of different um, cases. Thank you for that question, Bill. I 
I think that I saw one other question, and we'll use this as our as the last question for the evening. It's from Eileen again. Uh, I know you meant. I think you mentioned shimasen or the the yeah. string instrument uh, in that quote. But were there other cultural activities uh, that you know of that the the Japanese uh, sex workers maintained either alone or with each other? Um, that's that's a good question. So I think you are talking more about. Um, Japanese traditional cultural activities. Yeah, uh, uh, not too sure. Yeah, I, I read about shamisen. I've read about women reading Japanese language, novels and stories, but I just can't think of anything else immediately. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um. Uh, Sue asked one more question. <laughs> uh, well, well, if you have the, uh, the time, since that answer was a little shorter, maybe we can get uh, this question in as well. Uh, that there are Japanese men in the sex trade as well. Would they have worked out of brothels? They are usually pimps or procurers. So in terms of pimps, sometimes they are um, pseudo husbands of sex workers, um, but they wouldn't be sex workers. I, I just don't know. Maybe there was there were cases, but I just haven't encountered any record of men working as sex workers. But there are certainly pimps, and again, they are taking care of um, you know the kitchen work, right? Um, as the the excerpt that I show you um, tells us. Yeah, I, th I found that so interesting, the, that they were the ones doing the kitchen work. I hope that they were good cooks for the sake of the ladies. Um, so that uh, brings our presentation to a conclusion. I want to thank you so much, Ayaka, for taking the time to share your research with us here. I think I speak for any everyone when I say that this has been such an interesting look into, into this history that we are, well, at least I know, speaking for myself, I was completely unfamiliar with up until this point. Uh, I want to also take a moment to thank the sponsor of our Ed Talks, the East Kootenai Community Credit Union. It's through their sponsorship that we're able to reach out to presenters like Ayaka and have them come and share their knowledge with us here today. And then, of course, to thank our members, because without our members, we wouldn't be able to put on such wonderful programs such as this. We do have a number of uh, exciting programs going on at the center this summer, and I'm actually going to send a message in the chat right now for those who are interested in learning about uh, what else is going on and maybe getting a bit more involved with uh, learning about Cranbrook's history. Um, and with that being said, uh, uh, thank everyone. Thank you everyone so much for, for coming out tonight. Thank, thank you. you.